the, the secret to, to where I've gotten to where I am is by scaling up, by buying myself time. And how I've done that is from delegating. I've been very intentional about brainstorming things like, okay, for the first two years I did my podcast, I was kind of editing a lot of it and spending a lot of time in the weeds, making it perfect. When it, I finally accepted the fact that someone else can do it for a fraction of the cost better than I can. And I can open up my time to spend more time on getting my real estate license, finding clients, doing deals. Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is Jeff Lerner, your host. Excited to be with you as always. Today, I am joined by Chris Bello. He's, uh, I actually got to meet Chris. I was on his show. It's been probably a couple months. And we had a fantastic conversation, which I'm excited to continue here. He is a top producing realtor. He's the host of the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast, which is one of the top 10 business podcasts currently. And he's a productivity guru, which I'm very excited to dig into. Always looking to get more productive. Chris, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, grateful that you made the time. Uh, first thing I gotta, I gotta probably call out is, and, and I know not, some people are listening, they're not watching on YouTube, but so you're wearing a Texas A&M shirt. That is, <laughs> that's your alma mater, I presume. That is my alma mater. I just needed a collared shirt for the day, you know? Right. <laughs> cool, well, I, uh, I'm a big, yeah, and, and obviously you're based in Houston, Texas, which is where I'm from. Yep. I have uh, multiple family members that went to Texas A&M and I actually own an apartment, a small apartment complex in Bryan, which is mostly A&M students. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm very familiar with A&M and I uh, love that place, love, the, love the, the culture there. And I love Houston, honestly. I'm, I'm nostalgic just talking to you, kind of, miss, kind of miss Houston. What part of Houston are you in? Um, I live in East Downtown Houston. I'm actually putting my house up for sale, but I'm familiar with downtown area. My family's from the Missouri City Sugar Land. Uh, area and then I went to school at Strake Jesuit if you're familiar with that on Bel Air Boulevard so I am we talked yeah. about it remember uh, yeah, oh, I, I remember very well yeah my, my school uh, St. John's we used to play sports with you guys yeah at Strake Jesuit in fact I think when I was there who was it that Strake had that was that was kind of unbeatable for us I want to say it was maybe Calvin Murphy Jr. Calvin we Murphy the he was a Hall of Fame basketball player, and I think his yeah. son was at Strake Jesuit during my time in high school, and yeah, you, you guys just clobbered us, at least the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're in, uh, is that, is East Downtown, is that what's considered the East End? Yeah, the East End, they call it like the East End Revitalized Edo. Yeah. It's basically five minutes from downtown near Minute Maid Compass and BBVA. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the places to do stuff were pretty close, almost walking distance to that. Yeah, that's a great area. I actually have a, a small apartment complex off of Telephone Road, kind of right yeah. around there. And then you mentioned Missouri City. I have a, a single family down in, in Missouri City that awesome. I'm, I rent out. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's funny that you're so localized to my, like I'm not a huge real estate guy, but it just so but happens you, know. you have, you have a you know, connection to a lot of the places where I do own real estate. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into that. But before we do, uh, I would love it. I mean, you're pretty young, obviously, to have done, or at least you look young. I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't assume. <laughs> but clearly, you've done a lot um, based on kind of where you are in life. Do you mind teeing up how it is that you sort of so quickly moved into entrepreneurship and really, you know, kind of crushing it at your own results? Yeah, sure. So I actually had a coffee meeting with uh, with a real estate investor earlier this week, and he said the same thing. He's like, you know, I know I'm, I'm considerably older than you. Like, how old are you? Early 20s? And I was like, I actually turned 30 in August. I just look younger than I am. But I guess still relatively young for being in the entrepreneurship range. But of course, it's all relative. There are seven-year-olds making YouTube videos on toys and making <laughs> right. millions of dollars, right? Um, 
And then the guy from, what was it? The KFC guy, he made his money in his 60s too. Yep, so it's yep. always competition with yourself. But my story kind of goes, you know, I went to A&M, I went to Strike Jesuit. I kind of followed my friends from a Catholic private um, middle school to Strike Jesuit for high school. Then I went to college because all my friends went to A&M. So mm-hmm. I should go to A&M, right? That was kind of the thinking. And so I always kind of played in this comfortable area of, oh, I don't want to have a random roommate. Let me just room with one of my friends from high school. And so I kind of started to stay within that circle, right? And it wasn't until after I graduated and I got a dream job that I thought was my dream job that three and a half years in, I started to realize like, this this is my dream job. Like, this isn't even fun. I, I can't wake up and go to this every day. The meetings didn't inspire me. And I started reading books. I got into, I got myself into trouble by reading books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad and mm-hmm. Four Hour Work Week. And then I could never think the same again, right? I was like, I'm in a cubicle. I'm trading my time for money. All these ideas that you come up with as an entrepreneur, or not that you come up with, but that you come across rather. Mm-hmm. And then it was no turning back from there. I quit the job. I pursued several ideas that failed or, you know, did not quite work out as I planned. I was overly optimistic. I still am to an extent, but maybe a little more cautious at, the, at this point in time, but I kind of found my way into real estate and I started a podcast way before I got into real estate. I stumbled through several different ideas, a product invention that didn't quite pan out. And I'm finding my success now that I finally picked something and stuck to it for a long enough period of time. Ah, there's a profound little insight right there that uh, you started. I stuck six, with something. <laughs> yeah. You focused on one thing. Um, So we'll talk more about that, I suspect, but let's, I want to step back to something else you said. You said that you've always been really optimistic and maybe now it's a little more of a, of a cautious optimism, but we were talking about this before the show, you know, at the time we're recording this, we are not, we are not operating in a time of great optimism. There's a kind of a cloud over the world right now, at least especially, but I suspect more than just in the United States. Uh, a lot of people, and this probably is true through all, to all of history, a lot of people seem to think that like, it's meant to be hard, it's meant to be a struggle, it's meant to be, and I don't want to say it's meant to be a grind, because it is meant to be a grind, but like, it's meant to be a grind that doesn't ultimately pay off, is how I think a lot of people look at the world. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about that optimism and enthusiasm and kind of what's, what's the right amount of optimism to, to propel someone to success at, you know, business and ultimately life? That's a good question. And I think it varies based on what you're doing. You need enough optimism to actually try something because if you're too pessimistic or maybe some pessimists will call themselves themselves realists rather, and they'll never really take the chance because the likelihood of failure is so high, right? I forget the crazy statistic of how many real estate agents or how many businesses start that fail and the, the odds are stacked against you, but there's plenty of opportunities out there and stories of people who have done it against all odds. They pick something, they focused, they stuck with it long enough. And I think if you're able to do that and have a little bit of optimism enough to get yourself out of bed and think that there's a point to everything that you're doing, you need to have that optimism. Otherwise, it's going to be, like you said, 2020, this cloud hanging over us. You, you might get out of bed and just think of all the bad things happening and the politics and the, the virus and all the craziness that's happening and riots. And it's, it's very easy to be overwhelmed and be like, what's the point of trying anything? None of this matters. But if you stay focused, and I, I mentioned before the call too, my therapist jokes that uh, it's toxic positivity in a way because I'm right. so against hearing anything negative. I don't want to hear it at all. I'm in denial in some cases where I don't see any of that. I'm having my best year ever in terms of real estate. Like last month was my strongest month. I'm consistently getting new business. And maybe it's because of my optimism that I'm attracting clients to me that need that beacon of light in this dark time. So Hmm. um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I think you need enough optimism to be crazy enough to try something, but not too much where you don't do your due diligence. Yeah, I I really agree. And yeah, I think it very well answered the question. I, I feel like you need... The, you need enough optimism to do it, but but then I don't know that due diligence and, and that caution, I don't really think of that as anti-optimism. It, right. In a way, I think that, and I've probably fallen prey to this at times in my past, where 
uh, the, the, there's almost sometimes a scarcity mentality around optimism where it's like, I'm going to get really excited about this thing and it has to work because it's the only thing. Mm -hmm. And that I think can lead someone to be a little bit reckless where the optimist says, I'm going to do this thing, but you know what? I'm going to do my research because if, if it turns out this isn't the thing, I'm optimistic there will be other things. Exactly. You know, so I don't actually see those as, as opposing forces. I, I see it as, as the difference between uh, maybe intelligent optimism and reckless optimism. And that's, yeah. a, that's a lesson I've, <laughs> I mean, I'm 41, <laughs> so I'm saying it like, like it's so self-evident, but it took me the better part of four decades to figure it out. Um, okay, so you graduate college, you do the job. What, what was the job for three years that you did? So I got a, a relatively good job. I actually was one of the people who got a job that was in my degree and I studied supply chain. I got a job in a supply chain rotation program, which was like some prestigious program to be groomed for leadership in a fortune 200 or 100 company, huh. um, oil and gas, Baker Hughes services company. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, they were basically grooming me in this three-year program to take up that mantle of being a supply chain leader in the organization long term. And it, I, I don't know, I just found that I was getting bored quickly and I was still rotating within, within the company. Every six months, I'd have a new role, a new position, a new team. And even that, I was still not finding myself getting engaged with the work that I was doing. And I found myself connecting with people. I loved making friends. I didn't quite love doing stuff in Excel all day. Right. And that was where that dissonance occurred. But yeah, I spent three and a half years in oil and gas. Um, Huge company. I mean, thousands of employees across the world. So, what what was it about that that ultimately seemed unfulfilling? And before you answer, let me let me kind of frame the question. So, yeah, you know, you were essentially you were in grooming or or training, you could call it for th you know three years. It's not like what they had you doing for the three years was what you were going to be doing for the rest of your life, right? Right, Ideally, they're right. grooming you for something like you're going you're gonna to graduate to the next thing. So my guess is, since you seem like a pretty uh, you know, circumspect person, that it wasn't just that what you were doing for three years wasn't fulfilling, but that what you saw yourself doing from there for the next 10, 20, 30 years didn't seem like it was going to be fulfilling either. Is that right? Exactly. That is so right. That's, very, that's a very good observation. And the way that it worked was that I'd have meetings with managers. I'd have meetings with the VP of supply chain. I look at what they were doing all the time. Yeah. And I was like, that's where I'm going to be. And it doesn't look like a place where I'd want to be, right? Do I want to be doing calls at nine or 10 o'clock at night with uh, the team in Singapore mm -hmm. or being at the office at four or 5 a.m. to try to catch someone when they're in the office um, and being under constant stress and meetings about random things that seem like, you know, they're basically just roasting meetings. They want to grill you for stuff and you have no control over them mm. and you've got to manage all these different people and teams. And I just, I just didn't want to be a part of it, you know? And again, it was, I'm not an engineer, so none of the tools or anything like that, I didn't understand them, nor did I really care to, to be honest. Right, right. And I was like, how do I do something fun, you know, make content or just like talk to people and make vlog videos and podcasts. Of course, I didn't start off doing all those things that kind of, happen gradually. But just like you pointed out, I noticed where I was headed and I didn't want to be there. And, and I would assume, I mean, those people whose lives you, you determined you did not want to have, I mean, if somebody's a VP of, you know, supply chain at a fortune 100 level oil company, like they probably made a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I used to think the money was everything, you know, I, I got mm -hmm. it. It made so much sense once I was three years in and I had savings and I you know, paid all my bills and I paid off my car and I bought a house and I still had that hole inside, right? I had, yeah. my purpose wasn't being fulfilled. And it, and then I finally realized, hey, money isn't everything at a certain point. I think the number is like $70,000 a year. After that point, your level of happiness does not really increase that much. You know, your mm -hmm. bills are paid, you've got a roof over your head, uh, you get to travel a little bit. And so you're, you're so right in that I just realized that the money wasn't everything for me anymore and the time was something that I valued more. Hmm. So <clears throat> I have to say, you know, something I was thinking right before we, we, we got together on this, this conversation, I was thinking most jobs, like there's training, right? And in your case, there was three years of training. 
it's expensive to train people, right? Yeah. Why would they train you for three years? And, and, and before I answer the question, in contrast, as an entrepreneur, I mean, you even, even as a real estate agent, uh, where, where there's sort of still like a, a quasi job-like, you know, aspect to it, where there's a brand and there's a, there's a, an entity that's going to, you know, make money when you make, make money or make money when you do your work and that sort of thing. But even, and, and I know which, uh, which brokerage you're with and they're, they're one of the best, at least reputation wise in terms of training, but still nonetheless, the training there is nothing like it is with, with a corporate job, right? Right. And so my theory on that is why would they invest so much into you when you're starting a job? I mean, these are, these are for-profit businesses. They're not in the habit of making bad investments, right? It's right. because they're going to get it back out of you and then some. Oh, yeah. They're going to squeeze you for decades. Whereas entrepreneurship, really, there's nobody who's got a huge vested interest in saying, okay, I'm going to take a year and I'm going to work with this person and I'm going to help them be successful as an entrepreneur. And I think that's a reason why a lot of people go, eh, I don't want to do that. I don't know if I'll succeed at the, you know, I need more support. But you got to look at the ultimate economics of the other person, the other business on the other side of it is if nobody's willing to invest, you know, years or months in training you to be an entrepreneur, you know, pro bono, let's say, or, or even paying you to be trained, it's probably because they're not, there's not a big payoff for them, which actually is a good thing because it means you get to keep all the rewards, exactly. right? And I think a lot of people have this filter of like, well, if I'm going to go into something, I need to be trained. It's like, no, no, no. You don't want to be looking for things where people will spend months or years training you because they're doing that so that they can get it all back out of you and then some. Whereas if you go into something where it's kind of like, hey, here's the book, here's the course, here's the knowledge, figure it out. That actually probably indicates that you're going to get to keep all the, the fruits of your effort once the time comes, right? Right. And that was what was most appealing to me is that I thought if I'm going to work this hard for anyone, why don't I just do it for myself? And especially after I started reading those kinds of books, like mm -hmm. for our work, we can rich dad, poor dad. I'm like, yeah, I got to build assets and I got to invest in things. I can't be just stuck here. Um, sharing my time and my life. Basically I'm trading my life. I'm trading my time for someone else's goals, right? That didn't really align with, with my purpose. Yeah. Those, those books have been the undoing of, of so <laughs> many, so many, uh, employees, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And they're, and they're so good. Um, so, all right. So you, I mean, again, you're young, you pivot, you decide to start a podcast. You've got some other stuff going on. You start doing real estate. And if I'm doing the math, you said you started the podcast before you started doing real estate, right? Correct. Correct. And the podcast is what, three years old? Yeah. Podcast is about three so years old. So you've been old. doing real estate less than three years. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I know the statistics on real estate. I actually just uh, got done interviewing a guy, Rock Thomas, who you may know. He's uh, yeah comes from the real estate industry and now he does, you know, he's a big influencer and uh, author and all this cool stuff. But we were talking about the data on real estate. I mean, it's, it's appallingly bad <laughs> and it doesn't seem to matter. I mean, whether you're at, let's say uh, what's like a, a super low support, like one of these 1% real estate companies that probably don't train you at all. Or you're on the other side, maybe at like a Keller Williams where they're kind of known for their training it doesn't really seem to make that much difference. The bottom line is most realtors don't do much. Right. Um, what, what's, what's the difference here where in less, clearly less than three years, um, you've, you've built up such a great business so quickly in an industry that's statistically so improbable to do so. Yeah, thanks for asking. In, I mean, it, it's easy to, to think about all the things that could go wrong, right? Like I heard the statistics when I joined, I didn't want to be one of those stats. I didn't want to be one of the few or one of the many rather at the bottom doing no deals or only one deal a year. What I think made the difference is that I quickly aligned myself with mentors and experts in the industry. There was a time after I quit my oil and gas job and I tried a couple things that didn't work out and I spent some money, some of my savings on ideas and Facebook ad spend that just disappeared basically where I humbled myself and I said, okay, let me, let me take a job with two, you know, 33 year old dudes in Houston that one of them went to A&M, one of them went to my college and they were both, you know, having a great life. Like they had their own business, they're investing in real estate, they're doing some flips, 
and they had like an office, but it had a bunch of Grant Cardone, you know, motiv- motivational yeah. posters everywhere. I was like, these are my people. This doesn't feel like a job. This feels like a, a sales team going out there and, you know, crushing it. And so I actually aligned myself with them. I got myself started in real estate by joining them for about a year. And then I got my license and kind of branched off on my own because I still was finding I wasn't quite getting where I wanted to go. And while I had a team in place, I learned so much from them. I have a check in my home office of the first deal that I did with that team. And they got my mindset right. They told me like, Chris, like you are an entrepreneur, even within this business, like you're your own entrepreneur. You're responsible for going out and getting business, finding people, doing business development. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you have to buy massages for people to get leads, go do it. And they gave me that, that freedom and that mindset that I needed to go out there and, and treat everything like I was hunting. You eat, what you're, you eat what you kill in real estate. That's a saying, right? You only eat what you kill. And, that, and I don't want to say like kill your clients or anything. You got to go out there and hammer down deals. You've got to go knock on doors or do Zoom calls, right? Speak at virtual events maybe now in, in 2020. And so I had a platform. I had a podcast and I'm very active on social media. A lot of people are afraid to pick up the camera and do a Facebook live video. Mm-hmm. I don't mind doing that every single day. And I think those little things, aligning myself with experts, and being willing to go on camera and speak impromptu you know, every single day, that's what really helps me stand out instead of just putting a little sign with balloons at an open house and saying like, right. oh, come, come by for cookies at my open house. Like I don't do that stuff. You know, it's interesting you talk about using social media to, to grow that business. I, I sometimes say this and maybe it sounds a little bit cocky, but I don't know, is, is the truth cocky or is it just the truth? I often say, If I decided to be a real estate agent, an insurance agent, an auto mechanic, an attorney, like like any one of these trades, if I decided to do that here in the market that I live in, in St. George, Utah, which is a a county of about 200,000 people, I'm 100% convinced I could be the number one producer in just about any industry as long as I was competent in two years because of exactly what you just said. I'll go out there. I'll take the, the slings and arrows, I'll create content, I'll build a name for myself, I'll connect with my audience before I ever ask them to do any business with me. Right. I'm willing to do what most people aren't willing to do. Sounds like so are you. And so there, I mean, that is the answer to the question. Say, hey, how'd you go from zero to hero so fast? Because you're willing to do this stuff that most people aren't willing to do. And the reason I say that is, I think everybody listening to this conversation, probably needs to really, really look themselves in the mirror and say, what do I want more? Comfort, like to stay comfortable or to have my dreams come true? Now, some people may have different dreams than you and me. They, they, may, it may, they may just have zero interest in, in financial abundance and freedom of opportunity and freedom of time and freedom of location and all this stuff that I just kind of take for granted. It's like, well, why, you know, everybody must want those things. Maybe right. there's some outliers out there, but for the vast majority of people, would you say that as long as you're doing something that has at least some people who have succeeded at the thing, that the tools exist, that there's no reason why you can't succeed at the thing? That's, that's 100% true. If other people have done it, I think I heard Gary Vee say it, but it's been said many times before. If anybody ever did it, you can too, right? I mean, maybe I'm not going to go out and make Facebook. I could, maybe, right? But if anyone's been a top agent, if anyone's been a top insurance agent, anything that you just mentioned, right? You can become an expert by modeling, learning from them, investing in courses, and just doing the work. The work is the hard part, yeah. right? It's easy to oh, I listened to this podcast and I read that book and I watched this YouTube video. When it comes to make a Facebook Live video every day, post on social media, do two podcasts a week, that's where it's harder to stay consistent. I'm sure you're seeing that as well. It's like, whoa, it's a lot of work to, to keep up with a consistent podcast. You're constantly looking for guests and putting out new videos, right? Yeah, it's hard, but it's not harder. I mean, it, it takes me less time to do all that than it would to like, trade all my time for a paycheck. I mean, that's like 40, right. 50 hours a week as a baseline. Never mind the commute, never mind, never mind the expected work that you're supposed to do outside of work to stay up to date in your field or continuing education. Like you're talking, you know, probably 3,000 hours a year of commitment for that paycheck when mm-hmm. like 
I mean, I don't spend that much time on everything you just described and then some. No, um, not at all. And it, it's so much more scalable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's interesting, you know, one of the things I was thinking when we were about to hop on to talk, and I had no idea that you had literally just had your most successful month of your career in real estate. So props to you, because again, thank you. I think there's a lot of people that think that, that more like physical brick and mortar, you know, industries where you go have meetings, or you go shake hands, or you, you have to meet at the title company. Like, I think a lot of people think that those industries are like, dead right now or they're right. frozen and that the only people having results are like you know digital just online marketers. digital marketers or something right but mm -hmm. you're crushing it at both and you said you also just had a massive jump in your downloads on your podcast yes yes so, it just so, jumped like nine nine or ten thousand downloads month over month yeah so so is it fair to say that the pervasive cynicism in the world right now is literally a man-made delusion it's definitely fair to say that I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I've got, I mentioned I have this apartment complex in uh, Bryan near Texas A&M and I got an email maybe two or three, I don't know, last week or a few days ago that said something to the effect of, you know, they're not really sure if they're going to reopen the school. And, you know, all, all of my tenants are college students. I mean, it's Texas A&M. It's, yeah. it's like half a mile from the, or maybe a mile from the campus. So all my tenants are college students. So if they don't open the school and, and there's a prospect that they may not open it for like, let's say a, a semester or longer, I could end up going from 100% occupancy to 100% vacancy in like a few months. I mean, that's, that's pot. And I think there's actually laws that tell me I have to let people out of leases. I don't know. I don't know all the, the laws right now, but I mean, I could have a serious problem on my hands as a real estate investor, right? But right. you know what? I looked at the email and I was like, eh, that sucks. <laughs> but I don't even remember. I mean, here as I'm retelling you about the email, I don't even remember the details. Like, wait, when are they closing school? Or what are the laws tell me? Or I didn't even email her back to be like, hey, um, well, so where does, what does this mean for me? And, you know, I, like, I'm just You're like- You're on to the next thing. Well, yeah, because my digital businesses are doing so well right now that I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to change it. So whatever curveball they throw me, I'll either I'll either swing or I'll I'll take the walk or whatever. But like I can't change it. So let me exactly. just keep focusing and leaning in on things I can change. So I look at digital and physical as like a kind of a yin and yang, almost a hedge. Mm -hmm. That's how I was thinking before this conversation. But what I'm hearing you say is that actually physical real estate is booming, or at least if you do it right. Definitely, definitely. And don't get me wrong, I'm doing most of this digitally and I'm really taking the, the COVID situation as a chance to really push every meeting towards Zoom. Yeah. I know people like to do listing appointments and things like that face to face, especially a lot of the old school uh, realtors who've been in the game a long time. They feel like you got to be sitting belly to belly at the kitchen table, but that's not the case. You know, you just get everyone's getting on Zoom it eliminates the need for me to drive all the way across town to go to different transactions. And yeah. I can do three or four Zoom calls in a day. The only limit is how many people can I get to reach out to me. That's on me to go generate new business. I could have 10 Zoom calls a day with people who want to buy or sell a house. Whereas before, if I had to go to 10 different people's houses and they lived all across town, maybe I'd be cut in half at four or five appointments tops. Yeah. I actually love that. You know, talk about entrepreneurs take problems, which we don't really like that word. I think we prefer challenges, challenges. but we, we convert them into opportunities. What you're saying is, oh man, there's this virus and it totally smacked down the real estate industry. But you know what? If you just embrace change and realize that 90% of your competition's not gonna embrace change and they're gonna spend the next six months boohooing, you can actually dramatically, now that I'm saying it, it doesn't surprise me that you've grown your business. You can dramatically grow your business because you can literally steal it from all the people that are feeling stuck just because right. they're not willing to adapt. Exactly. I'll bet you you've had deals that you closed last month where that person was either contract, not, maybe not contractually, but they had either verbally or at least theoretically agreed to work with another realtor and that other realtor disappeared because they felt like they couldn't do business in the modern climate. Right. I, I bet that's the case. And I know everybody, that's the thing. That's a limiting belief I had when I first got my license is, oh, everyone's a freaking realtor. Everyone and their mom has their license, right? 
And there's so many realtors out there, but like you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago, most of them, the stats are pretty depressing on how few really do deals. And I mean, of course, if I have a friend and their mom has their license, like, okay, you got to go with your mom. I get it. You're right. probably not going to go around your mom and work with, with somebody else. But most people, they know five, six, seven realtors. What's the difference? Someone just told me the other day, Chris, like, you know, you're a millennial, you market to this demographic. I see all your content in your Facebook lives and the other realtors that we had in mind, they don't do any of that stuff. So they yeah. knew that I was going to get their message out more when I'm trying to sell their house than the average person would just from promoting open houses or I don't know what they, what they do, put right. things up on Craigslist or something, right? It's just old, the old ways aren't really quite working anymore and it's time to adapt. You know, I would, I, when I joined, uh, when I started marketing online I, in 2008, I was a member of this, this platform. It was a training platform that had, I found out later, they had 40,000 members. Wow. Um, at the time, I just knew that they had, I didn't know the number of members. That was kind of proprietary data, but I knew they had thousands of members because I could see their, their, you know, their groups and the, the chat rooms and everything. And I knew that they were in 200 countries. So I had reason to believe they were pretty big. And based on the amount of debt that I was in at the time, I did the math. I went and looked at the leaderboards and figured out that I needed to be at least in the top 10, maybe in the top five, in order to even have a chance of paying off my debt and kind of fixing my life. And I've had people ask me like, okay, so you, you said you entered this environment where you needed to be, gosh, what's that, in the top 2% of the top 1%, <laughs> the top 0.02% in order for it to be worth your while. How did, you, how did you even get started? How did you take action? How did you have the confidence to do it? And what I always say, and I would say this is totally true for realtors. I would say this is totally true for insurance agents. I would say this is totally true for attorneys. Did you know, a lot of people don't know the average attorney makes less than the average teacher. I would say this is totally really? true for any category where you have bleak statistics is like, imagine you enrolled in a, in a sports league, right? And you got the, and it was, you know, you're going to go play basketball and you found out that everyone on the court was five years old. Would it matter how many opponents there were if they were all five years old? No. Like you would crush that league. You would score a hundred points a game, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's every one of those industries is populated with millions of people who have, maybe they're not shorter than you, but they're playing smaller than you, right? So what, how is that a challenge? To me, that's such an opportunity. I'm going to go score 100 points a game because my competition's barely showing up. What's, what's, what's your take on that? Am I, am I being too, uh, am I, am I, full of hubris and being too, um, you know, too cocky about what, what it's like out there? Or, I mean, you're around realtors all the time. Am I actually describing it accurately? Yeah, you're describing it very accurately. And that's with anything. I mean, there's, it's easy to get maybe, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, afraid or like you said, to play small because you see the numbers of competition, but the barrier to entry is so low in these things. I mean, you take a couple of classes, you take a little test and you've got right. your license Right. So if you look at the stats overall, it's it's pretty crazy to see. I think there's like 40 or 50,000 licensed real estate agents in Houston. And there's probably even more because of the market being so hot after the lockdowns have lifted. Right. The market's been kind of on fire. So everyone's like, oh, I should get my license too. This is a great time to do it. I'm working from home. So if anything, there may be even more real estate agents coming into the market. But like you said, just because there's a lot doesn't mean they're really doing what it takes you might be quote unquote playing against the five-year-olds right. that are doing this as a side hustle. They're not really committed. They've got a full-time job. They kind of just want to get their license to see if real estate works out. But the thing is, the secret is that you and I know is that if you dabble in something, you're most likely not going to be successful in it. You've got to go all in and you've got to stay focused and commit, which a lot of people aren't willing to do. Yeah. It's like, you know, I Mr. Miyagi told Daniel-san in The Karate Kid, he said- Wax on, wax off. <laughs> yeah, he said, he said, if you're, you know, karate is like uh, being a grape. And, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's like, there's two sides of the street. And if you're like, a grape is on one side of the street, that's like, yeah, I'm not going to do karate. Like, okay, he's fine. 
if the grape is on the other side of the street, it's like, I'm, I'm doing karate. Great. You're fine. But if a grape's in the middle of the street, it's like karate. And then Miyagi goes, it's squish, just like grape. <laughs> and that's really how it is. And really, I think if people understand your only competition are the people on the very sparsely populated side of the street of people that are actually executing at a really high level. That should be your only competition because it's a category you should decide to put yourself in or else, you know, to Miyagi's point, don't bother. So I'm curious. I know you're a big productivity guy. Yeah. Obviously, you're really successful and you juggle two very time consuming things, which are podcasting and real estate. Um, what do you what what do you do to make that possible? And I'm curious, what do you think someone else has to do to even enter into the realm of being your competition? That's a great question. And I'm gonna give away some secrets. Hopefully I don't get anybody too competitive it's, listening. This is millionaire Houston. secrets, so it's expected. <laughs> You're right, we gotta share the secrets. So yeah. anyone in Houston, I mean, first of all, I see things as a an abundant minded um, approach. So I, I welcome it. There's more than enough business for everyone who's willing to work for it. But the, the secret to, to where I've gotten to where I am is by scaling up, by buying myself time. And how I've done that is from delegating. I've been very intentional about brainstorming things like, okay, for the first two years I did my podcast, I was kind of editing a lot of it and spending a lot of time in the weeds, making it perfect. When it, I finally accepted the fact that someone else can do it for a fraction of the cost better than I can. And I can open up my time to spend more time on getting my real estate license, finding clients, doing deals. And even when it comes to deals, I oftentimes delegate things within the transaction. I have a transaction coordinator. She does all the paperwork. I've got a couple of showing agents that are newer agents that want to learn from me. And in exchange, I kind of mentor them and then they'll run some errands for me and I'll pay them for their time hourly. But the other day, I didn't feel like showing a house. I was just like, eh, it's been a long day. I'm, I'm a little tired. Hey, Courtney, can you go show this house to my client at three o'clock? And she went and did it. And I just Venmoed her for her time afterwards. So that allows me to scale up instead of me tying up one or two hours of time with that. I got to go to the gym or do whatever else I wanted to do. And she took care of it for me. And if he wants to write an offer, my transaction coordinator does that. And that will go under my name. I would get the credit for the commission. So... You mentioned you, you, you passed on a, on a showing so that you could maybe go to the gym or whatever. How, um, how intentional and, and effective, I mean, would you say you are at kind of balancing those different areas of life where it's not just all business, business, money, money all the time, but, you know, taking care of your, I mean, you look like you're in good shape. I, I don't know if you have a family or a relationship or anything, but I mean, what's kind of your juggling act look like? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I, I am guilty. I don't have any children or anything right now. I'm, I'm in a long-term relationship. We're not married or anything yet. Um, but she, my girlfriend does work quite a bit. She works at a, an accounting firm. And so sometimes she doesn't even get home till eight o'clock at night. So that opens up my time to go to the gym, do whatever I want. I, I got recurrent on my skydiving. I went the other week. <laughs> I was like, hey, I need to take this eight hour class so I can jump out of a plane again. And I did that. I spent the time doing that because I could. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good question on life um, balance and intentionality. And so I've got booking links. That's another hack that I like to use. I use Calendly for my booking links. And I created rules that play along with my schedule, with my ideal schedule. And so most recently, I removed booking links from Fridays and Sundays because people were booking me every day of the week at all hours of the day. And I was like, man, I don't want to be doing calls at 6 p.m. on a Friday anymore but my calendar link was allowing that to happen. And so mm -hmm. I removed it. And then I found the following week or two, oh, I have nothing on my calendar for Friday. This would be a good day to go and get a couple of skydives in or go to the park or mm -hmm. take the dog to the dog park, things like that. And so I've been doing as much of a, uh, the best job that I can balancing having fun, traveling, skydiving within reason with COVID restrictions and stuff and spending time with my girlfriend on top of making sure my clients feel like I'm not just out at the park all day. I'm actually getting their deals done. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I will say, and you, you may, well, you went through my booking link for this show even. I just recently removed Thursdays yep. from my availability for the show. And it's compartmentalized now just down to Tuesdays and Wednesdays because I realized, hey, I have some, some creation work, some content. Um, internal content, training content I need to create and I'm not having enough time. So yeah, you know what? Let me just subtract a little availability here. 
exactly. and it frees it up there. It's amazing. This, you know, I, I, and that's a small example, but there are a hundred different ways that technology can facilitate quality of life to a, to a non-duplicatable degree. Like there's nothing you could do outside of the technology to capture the same benefit as just using the technology. Right. And I know a lot of people resist. Sense. Yeah, it wouldn't even make sense to have my assistant do it. Someone was like, I was going to do a podcast and someone said, hey, my assistant will coordinate it with you. When's a good time? And I was like, hey, not to throw your assistant to the side, but like this booking link is all we need. Pick right. a time that works. We don't have to go back and forth. And then it was done. It was set in stone and it was all automated because like you said, the systems got rid of the need for the human intervention. So do you think that, I mean, you spent three and a half years, this just kind of occurred to me, but it seems like a question worth asking. You spent three and a half years training on supply chain logistics, right? Which is a very mechanized way of organizing human action. You know, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. It's all about systems and processes, right? Because the stakes are so high. If, if, if a shipment doesn't arrive the day it's supposed to, it could cost two million dollars on the rig or whatever, right? right? So do you think that training influenced how you now approach your real estate business where it sounds like you've created a lot of similar types of chains that free you up? I think that it really has helped and sometimes I undervalue my degree and I, I like to think, oh, I could have figured this stuff out faster without wasting four years in college. Um, so I, I did learn quite a bit from my supply chain degree and my time at the oil and gas company because like you said, a lot of what I implement now, optimizing my time, booking links, delegating, automation, outsourcing, those are all things that we learned in supply chain. And I had projects of reducing logistics. We had freight shipping across the world and one of my projects would be like, you know, what if we ship to our hub in Dubai and then from there they, they shipped things out to the surrounding facilities instead of shipping straight to Singapore and to Dubai and to Sela, Germany. And so reducing costs, reducing time and lead time, those projects really did play a part in how I think and how I can reduce the amount of steps necessary, reduce the amount of people and human intervention required. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I think it did play a really big part of how I operate my business now. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And, and I will say from my personal experience, um, I didn't. I didn't get three years of of training at a big company that had all these processes already figured out. I kind of had to figure out yeah. on my own how much systems and processes e not only equal freedom but they equal opportunity and possibility. Like, you know, in the last two years, I finally said, "Okay, I will work as hard on systems and processes as I do on everything else, on myself, mm -hmm. on communication, on." value on products on everything. I'm going to work on systems and processes and it's allowed us in, in really less than two years of selling products to scale a business that's already three times as big as anything I ever did before this and with some really ambitious targets to keep growing and it's if I was a, not a believer before even though I was I'm now like a, a fanatic yeah. systems and processes will set you free and that's coming from a jazz musician I'm a creative. I hate the box. I mean, I have a thing on my wall. This is think outside the box. I do not like the box. I'm not a control guy. I resist authority. I resist being shoved into structure. But when you realize that systems and processes are freedom, you hopefully, like at least I have, and clearly like you are, you are a much quicker study than me. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll embrace them. So uh, I have one last question then, it, you know, I know we're, we're about out of time, but I want to shove in this one last question. Um, For you sure. talked about eating what you kill, right? And um, interestingly, on my earlier conversation, I mentioned I was interviewing Rock Thomas. We got into kind of the same thing about uh, the hunting metaphor, right? Like people, you know, Maslow's hierarchy and a lot of people are like, man, I just, I need to make 3000 or 5000 or $8,000 a month. Like I, essentially I have to go kill so that I can eat. I have to kill so that I can eat. Whereas building a business is not like hunting, it's, it's like farming. Right. You can't start a farm, you know, you gotta plant a seed on day one, it's gonna be maybe six to 12 months before you have food to eat. So to start a farm, you have to already have some food, right? You have, exactly. you have to already have killed something else, killed enough that you can eat while you farm for a while, right? So what do you say to someone 
who comes to you and says, man, I, I really want to get into this real estate thing, but you know, I think it's going to, you know, how long is it going to be before I can start generating commissions and I have no money. What do you recommend I do in the meantime? I'm curious how you'd respond to that. Yeah. So old me would have been like, Oh, quit your job, go all in on your dreams, you know, right. put your back against the wall. And then I did that. And then I kind of got into that scarcity mindedness where, Oh, I don't have money. I still have a mortgage to pay and I can't spend on fun things like traveling and skydiving like I used to because I don't really have any money coming in. Mm -hmm. So new me, now I'd, I'd probably be a little more conservative, optimistic, but conservative, like work really hard, you know, at your day job, earn that paycheck. If you're working at a job still and you're, you're fortunate enough to not have had that loss from COVID and all of that, get that paycheck. And as tired as you may be when you come home or on the weekends, yeah, I know you want to hang out with friends or watch TV or whatever, really treat it as a second job and go all in on that because the faster you can start generating income through commissions or whatever your side business is, when you can replace or at least get close to what you're currently making in your day job, then you can feel more comfortable about leaving that and going all in. But the, the challenge is that if, you're, if you've got a check coming in every two weeks, you're not quite as motivated to go out there and grind on the weekend and get that commission, right? So it's really up to you individually on how much work you're willing to put in. You could get a deal done in the first month or two, um, but more realistically, I'd probably plan on four or five months of just trying things, putting seeds out there, farming like you said, and then you'll see the benefits recurring month after month from that point on. Yeah, you know, I was thinking as you were talking and I kind of started to formulate this thought earlier when I was talking to rock that, you know, a lot of the times people look at their schedule and they say, Oh, I don't, I don't have the time. Right. Like, Oh, I work a job mm -hmm. 40 hours and it's like, okay, well there's still 128 hours in the week and I'm sure you sleep maybe, you know, 50 of them. So there's still 70 or 80 hours in the week. Like there's time. Yeah. Um, but you're somehow you're too busy. I was thinking if most people would look at their lives, I think that it's, it's, it would surprise people if they really understood how much of their time is spent doing things that they wouldn't actually do if they were blissfully happy all the time. And so what I've, I'm, and I'm trying to think like, how do I convey this to people so that they'll get it? And this is what I've come up with. So feel free to tell me that it's, it's, it's spot on or it could be improved or it's, it's garbage and I should scrap it. Um, yeah. you know that feeling like the first time you were in love, like you met a girl and just, oh my gosh, or a guy, I don't, you know, don't assume, but the first time you were just madly in love, right? And remember how like all of a sudden the things that you used to do, like you're not, you don't want to go do them because you just want to spend time with the girl all the time, right? Right. Right. Like I remember when I, when I even got my first girlfriend in high school, I was like, I didn't talk to my friends for a few months. Like I was, <laughs> I was probably a little too, too all in on that deal, yeah. which is probably why it broke my heart when it ended. But you know, imagine yourself, that's the closest thing I think nature gives us to like the level of serotonin that equals organic bliss. So imagine if you had that feeling, if you could recreate that feeling in your life of being so madly in love and feeling like your world is completed, what is it in your life that you could live without? Like if I was that in love, feeling those feelings again, would I let my poker night go with my friends? Would I be willing to skip my favorite series on Netflix? Would I be willing to, you know, not go tinker with my widgets in my shop or whatever? Like, if you were that in love to where you just wanted to be with that person all the time, what would you let go? Okay, now, let all those things go. Because if you use that time to start a side hustle that grows into a main hustle that frees you from your job, you're going to experience a level of bliss and joy that's actually far greater than that because it lasts forever. And I think exactly. that's the lens I'm kind of looking at, at my life and other people's lives through. Like I've done that. So I, I kind of live that way. But to help other people try to have some, something they can relate to about what's on the other side of the sacrifice. Because the, I mean, I'm sure you hear it too. People think they don't have time. But they do. Would you agree? I would agree. I've heard a quote that I really love. It's, it's not that we have a lack of time. It's that we have a lack of priorities. Mm. You know, there's always time. You can find time. Whenever people say they don't have time for something and then they're caught up on every Netflix show out there, 
that's where a lot of the time's going, right? It's like, oh, right. you didn't have time to work out, but you watch three three episodes of uh, what? What am I watching right now? I do watch Netflix every now and then, but I'm only limiting it to you know one episode in the evening right. while I'm maybe stretching. So I'm doing two things at once. I'm not blowing my entire evening watching the entire season of Stranger Things in one sitting. And don't get me wrong, I did plenty of that in college. I'm, I'm guilty. <laughs> right. Well, but we I all think have that, time. You know, you're uh, you're you've got a top ten podcast. You've got a thriving real estate business. You've got a growing brand. Like you've probably earned the right to watch a Netflix show if you choose. I hope but, so. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but I think people have to have really high standards about what do I deserve? Yeah. Do I deserve this episode of, of Ozark or whatever? I mean, for me, I'm, maybe I'm too hard on myself, but there's a lot of things I don't do because I'm like, I haven't earned that yet. I could afford it, but I haven't earned it. Yeah. So, for whatever that's worth. Go ahead. I do have one more tip that I can drop if we have time. Yes, absolutely. Well, if, if we have time, that's funny. After what we just talked yeah, about. I know, right? <laughs> but the way that I've kind of gotten around that recently, this is something I just implemented about a month ago, is I created a scorecard that tracks the daily activities that I think are most important to generate business, to create content. And so I've got different points assigned and my goal is to get to five points a day. And so if I do a podcast interview, if, or I, ha- if I have someone on my show, that's two points. If I go network with someone... And so sometimes I, I got my five points. I already get eight points by like noon and then I feel great. I'm like, Hey, I, I got my points for today. I've been on three podcasts. I've had other people on my show. I'm going to go hang out or take the dog to the dog park for two hours and not check my phone. I feel like I can earn that. And so a couple entrepreneurs, I bounce this off. They're like, Oh, I don't know. Like if they feel like they've always got to be working, yeah. but if you have a scorecard that can help, for you to feel like you've earned the right and you have a measurable thing that you've been tracking to show that you've put in the work. I actually so. love that. I, I really do. You know, at our company, we started a practice of journaling every day uh-huh. where at least the leadership team amongst us, we share our daily journals at the end of the day. And it's like, here's not only here's everything I did for the business, but you know, we, we're very intentional about physical, personal, and professional excellence. And so here are the deposits I made into my physical account. Here are the deposits yep. I made into my personal account, which is, you know, my relationships. And then here's obviously what I did professionally. And that, ex- that process of journaling has been so productive because nobody wants to turn in a report at the end of the day that's like, well, I worked really hard, but I did nothing for my body and I ignored my family. <laughs> like, right. there's almost like this positive uh, peer pressure from that. But I love the idea of saying, okay, even within the professional category, not all work is created equal. Mm-hmm. And there, need, there should be a value attribution to different tasks. You know, for example, doing this interview is worth more than, I'm trying to think of something I did earlier today. Like a social media post or something. Yeah, like posting on Instagram. Um, it, it, you know, there's probably different ways to score that. But, uh, but yeah, I love that idea, man. That's, that's genius. Um, so because we're out of time, I don't want to deprive people of the ability to get more wisdom from you. How can people come into your world and keep learning? Yeah, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity. So you can get a free guide on productivity hacks that I recommend by going to Chris Bello. That's just B as in boy, E-L-L-O dot com slash free. And that'll give you five productivity hacks. And I have way more than that if you follow my podcast, which is the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. Of course, Jeff, you were on that show and your, your episode was amazing. So everyone, you can go back and listen to that as well. Thank you. And then I'm most active on Instagram. If you go to chrisbello09, um, you can connect with me on there, send me a DM and just hang out. And I'd love to see if we can connect and maybe, you know, connect with more people from your audience as well. So thank you once again, Jeff. What's, what's 09? Is that when you graduated from high school, college? Yeah, that's my high school. <laughs> that's my, my high school year. I, yeah, I, you're just making me feel old here, man. <laughs> like, I didn't you know, someone that. took Chris Bello. Otherwise, I would have that and they've right. got no posts or anything. So the 09 has been something I've had on my email forever too. So it's just, I know I need to come up with a cooler name. But Hey, you know what? Since you mention it, I'm going to throw this out to the audience. There's a, so there's a guy named Jeff Lerner that has jefflerner.com that does nothing with it. Oh, I have offered this so guy. Frustrating. I literally emailed this guy. I'm like, dude, name I pay a you. price. I said, Look, start the bidding at whatever ridiculous number you think that I would never pay. Name a price. And the guy just replies, I'm not interested in selling. I've been tracking it for a decade. 
The He's guy done nothing. Did nothing with it. So to my audience, oh my I'm not one to like William Wallace style, like rally everyone. But like, if you want to heckle, great, great call to action. Yeah, if you want to make somebody regret their decision to camp on a domain and waste it, feel free to find Jeff Lerner of <laughs> JeffLerner.com. Hey, sorry, you got me off on a, a it's a little peevish. I feel the same way. I was like, hey, I'll pay you a hundred bucks. Like a right? thousand? Like, what do you want? Let and me, hey, go after, the and go go to Chris Bell. I don't know, maybe maybe this is inappropriate to say, but find Chris Bello on Instagram and be like, DM Dude, him. more interesting Chris Bello who should have your name. <laughs> I would love that. But I mean, I, I he has zero posts, zero anything. So I'm not oh. sure. But I feel your pain on that, Jeff. So hopefully everyone go take that action. Help help me and Jeff out to get those uh, domain and Instagram help, handles. Help entrepreneurs who are trying to deliver value and change the world, not uh, squatters who are just holding out on our real estate. So For real, yeah. for real. Well, anyway. thank you once again, Jeff. This was awesome connecting with you and I appreciate your time. Yeah, this has been great. I will. Uh, we put a landing page together for the episode. If anyone wants to go to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Chris B., you can download our free ebook. You can subscribe to the show and the YouTube channel. Appreciate everyone so much. Chris, I appreciate you being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. This has been wonderful. And to the audience out there, thanks for being you. You are the best part of the show and you're why we do what we do. Everyone take care. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you wanna learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.